Chapter 11 Michael was happy to be home. He could hear FedEx whining at the door. Is that a dog? Anne asked, confused. Max, who had accompanied them, just grinned. Michael entered the house and FedEx was jumping like she was on springs, easily reaching chest height. He leaned down and petted her roughly. She danced and licked his hands excitedly. "'About time! Thought you'd never come back!' Fenley yelled from the kitchen. "'You forget you live here, Mr. Michael?' Michael smiled and went to the kitchen where he greeted the housekeeper with a hug. She pushed him away. "'That dog wander all over house looking for you!' "'Hello, Fenley,' Anne greeted. She wondered when Michael had gotten a dog. "'Oh, Missy Anne back!' Fenley grinned. "'You staying?' "'I'll be helping Michael with his recovery,' Anne said. Max reached past the housekeeper for an apple and whispered something in her ear. She tittered. "'I hope so,' Fenley cackled. "'I make lunch?' Michael shook his head. He was tired just from the car ride. He yawned. "'I think we'll pass,' Max said. "'My big brother looks like he just wants to take a nap.' Max tagged along with Michael upstairs. Anne sat down at the breakfast bar and watched Fen Lee putter around. "'When did Michael get a dog?' Anne questioned. "'One day he bring in. Dog with him ever since. Sleep on bed.' Fen Lee wrinkled her nose. "'It sleeps on the bed?' Anne couldn't believe it. Michael wouldn't allow that, would he? "'Sure. It go everywhere with him.' Fen Lee shook her head. "'Good dog.' "'What's its name?' Fen Lee cackled again. FedEx. FedEx? You're serious? Anne laughed as Fenley nodded. So, you know answer right. You stay with Mr. Michael? Fenley put away the mop that she had been using. A few days at least. After that, we'll see, Anne hedged. We see, Fenley snorted. You go, Mr. Michael said. You stay, make happy. Fenley, it's not that simple, Anne sighed. Sure it is. Fenley looked at her watch. Oh, I late. Daughter music show. Must go. You stay, Missy Anne. Fenley grabbed her purse and hustled for the door. Max had brought the dog out to do its business. He brought FedEx back inside the living room and petted her. I really like this dog. You know, we were never allowed to have pets as kids. I never once thought Michael would want one. Anne was surprised as well. She knew Michael had a loving heart, but never thought he would be a dog person. Maybe a fish person, but not a dog person. However, he seemed to have adopted FedEx, and the dog was more than equally devoted to him. When Max stopped petting her, FedEx padded upstairs to find Michael. She'd probably crawl in bed with him again. Anne thought it was funny. She didn't see Michael as a person who'd let a dog sleep on the bed. Yet, he did. When do you leave for the honeymoon? Friday next week. Max grabbed a glass of water. Are you moving back in? Anne nodded. For a couple of days at least. Just until Michael isn't so tired. Are you going to tell him that you love him? Max cut to the heart of the matter. When he was deeply in love with the mystery woman? Probably not. Definitely not. She wondered if she should try to find out who this woman was. No. She really didn't want to obsessively compare herself to the perfection as Michael had called his mystery love. I think that's between Michael and I. Max sighed and put down the glass. As a man who is extremely happy right now, married to the woman he, whom he loves, I'm going to interfere a moment. I really wish you wouldn't, Anne said. It hurt too much. I don't know what's been going on between the two of you, but I think both of you has miscommunicated. Max came over and put his hands on her shoulders, looking down at her. Anne, he loves you. He might not say it, but he does. Like a kid sister, or a friend, like a secretary that he's had for over twenty years. She smiled sadly. Okay, I didn't want to do it, but I'm bringing out the big guns. Max grasped her arm and drew her along to the study. Max, we're friends. Of course he loves me, like a friend. Anne swallowed and said the dreaded words that haunted her sleep ever since she had learned his secret. Michael is in love with someone else. That's where you're wrong, Max said calmly. He grabbed a journal at random and checked for the date. Ah, here are the good ones. 
He's got away with a pen and a word. I've seen the poetry. He loves her, whoever she is, very much, Anne said miserably. Max stared at her. You're as blind as he is. Max, would you please just stop? She wiped away a tear. We shouldn't be invading his privacy anyways. Please, put the journal back. Invading his privacy? I've been reading his journals for years. Max shrugged. Sure, he doesn't know that I've been reading them, but I think it's about the only way to get inside his head and know what he was thinking, especially when he was being the perfect robot worker for our dad. Anne grabbed the journal and put it back. Anne, the poetry is about you. Some of it is even a little suggestive, considering who it's coming from. Max grabbed another volume. Her golden hair, her blue eyes, her fair skin, it's all about you. Trust me. Was it? It described her and mother probably 20% of the female population in the country. Anne tried to tamp down the hope that she felt. The poetry never mentioned her name. There was no way to know for sure. Max, it's not me. She makes the office seem more alive every time she enters. When the sun filters through the afternoon glass, her hair takes on a color like burnished brass. Max flipped through another section. See, it's an office romance. Whose hair does he get to see every afternoon? Hmm, I wonder who. He couldn't possibly be right. Maybe Michael's mystery woman was from the office. She'd give Max that much. She grabbed the book and put it on the shelf. Max, stop. He raised an eyebrow and grabbed another volume, holding it over her head so that she couldn't grab it from him. I lent Anne my umbrella since it was raining and she didn't have one. What neither of us counted on was the wind. When she returned from her dentist appointment, she was completely soaked through. I remember that, Anne said. And there was nothing special about that day except I ruined the umbrella. I don't know why he even put it in the journal. He lent me his suit jacket and let me go home early. Max smiled wolfishly. Really? You two sure have different memories. After you left, he wrote in this entry, and it describes your lovely curves as those wet clothes hugged your body. So he's a red-blooded male like any other and can appreciate the female figure. Anne glared at Max. Put the book back. Nope. Max grabbed another and flipped through to a random page. Anne is dating some guy named Greg Wilson. Did you know that he had every one of your boyfriends fully investigated? Not only is that illegal, but it's creepy when your boss is checking out your love life. I wonder why he did it. Could he be jealous? Greg seems to be a nice guy, but Michael certainly didn't like him if this entry is anything to go by. Anne put a hand over her eyes. It's odd, I'll admit it. He's obsessed with you. Max grabbed another book and read from a random page. Her colors are as vibrant as the brightest butterfly. Her smile a caress against dreary skies. She excludes perfection in every way. She grows more beautiful every day. Soon there will be no words that understand how to describe my ever-lovely Anne. Max looked extremely satisfied. Anne grabbed the book from him and scanned the lines, finding it word for word what he had recited. His Anne. His ever-lovely Anne. Max poked her on the shoulder with each word. He loves you. He loves you. She believed him. Michael loved her. All those beautiful poems about her. She hugged the journal. I believe my work here is done. Max bust her on the forehead and let himself out, whistling merrily. Michael absently petted FedEx as he reclined on the bed after his nap. He was sick of this cat-and-mouse sort of game that he and Anne had been playing. He was feeling better and really didn't even need to nap anymore, but if she thought he wasn't fully recovered, she might stay longer. He wanted her to stay in his life permanently. That meant he was going to have to make her want to stay. He had to tell her that he loved her. He had to gamble that she might choose to stay and try to love him in return. And he knew exactly how to tell her. He got up and padded barefoot to the study, grabbing the very last journal that he had written in. The words were right here for her to read. All he had to do was get her to read them. Then she would know. 
Then they could figure out what they were going to do with their lives. She'd either want to be with him, or she'd look at him with pity and move on with her life. He looked around the house and finally found her sitting on a window seat, a throw blanket over her lap, a mug nearby, and a book in her hand. It wasn't just any book. It was one of his journals. She flushed once he caught her reading it. I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have. It's just beautiful, the poetry. She was embarrassed. Most of the poetry was about her. It was fine. She could read every single one of them. Right now, he'd like her to read one particular entry. He took the journal out of her hand and put it to the side. Anne took it as an admonishment. I am sorry. I'll never do it again. I shouldn't have invaded your privacy. Michael knelt in front of her and flipped through the pages until he found the entry he was looking for. He held out the book to her. Surprised, Anne took it and read, Anne has quit. I am drowning. She looked at him with devastation in her eyes. Oh, Michael, I'm so sorry. It was the worst timing, quitting the day you got your prognosis. Michael shook his head and pointed to the opposing page. Anne turned her attention to the words. His last words that he wrote the morning before the board meeting, before the surgery. There was a hitch in her voice. These may be the last words I ever write. I love you, Anne. She pressed a hand to her mouth and stared at the page. It was right there in black and white if anyone had known where to find it. Michael had never felt so scared in all his life. Not even of the possibility of dying or waking up from surgery knowing that a huge hole in his life had happened with the damage to his brain. This mattered more than all of that. This was Anne, and he loved her. He stayed kneeling in front of her, waiting to see what she would do, what she would say. Anne started crying. Michael closed his eyes for a moment, letting the despair wash over him. He then removed the book from her hands and hugged her close. Whatever Anne wanted, it would be okay. It wouldn't be okay, but he would pretend that it was. Michael held her until her tears were spent. Anne pulled back and wiped her face on the cuff of her sweater. Oh, Michael, why didn't you tell me twenty years ago? He hadn't had the words then. He barely had the words now. She gave a bubble of laughter and wrapped her arms around him, hugging him tightly before whispering in his ear, I love you. She loved him. She loved him. Michael could feel joy spread through his chest. Then he kissed her. Tentative, then with desire. He picked her up brought her upstairs and to his bed. He was not going to waste another moment. As he joined her, Anne smiled dim and she put a hand to his shoulder. I'm not on any birth control, and I happen to know there are no condoms in this house, she warned. Michael put a finger to her mouth, silencing her. His hand crept along the hem of her shirt, and he raised it so they could put a gentle kiss to her abdomen. He would give her as many babies as she wanted. When he looked at her, Anne was smiling with tears in her eyes. He leaned forward, hungrily kissing her, and she didn't protest. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the next epilogue of Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.